Good evening, everyone. Greetings and welcome to IKG's Wisdom Wednesday. I am Ajwa, the coordinator and host for our Wisdom Wednesday sessions. And I want to thank everyone for joining us on this beautiful June evening. At least it's beautiful here in DC. Not sure where you all are checking in from, but well, we're about to, we're about to find out. But it's definitely a beautiful June evening here in DC. So as many of you all know, Wisdom Wednesday is a free monthly lecture series held every third Wednesday of the month. And for the remainder of this year, we will be conducting our Wisdom Wednesdays via Zoom webinar. So we are so thankful that we're able to have members of our family joining us from all over the globe. And we wanna shout out a few of the cities. We see we have Columbia, South Carolina in the house this evening, as well as New York City. Of course, Maryland is in the house. We have Jackson, Mississippi in attendance. San Diego, California, welcome, Cali. We have Tongva, Louisiana. We have San Francisco, Milwaukee, Atlanta, Brooklyn, Inglewood, Chicago, and of course, representatives from DC. Thank you all so much for joining us for our presentation this evening. Um, as you all know, I just want to let you all know, as you all are coming in on the room, in the room, IKG hosts a variety of various activities and events. And for those of you all who are in the area or are looking to book a trip to DC, we invite you to go to our website, ikgculturalresourcecenter.com, and look into booking one of our Egypt on the Potomac field trips. We are hosting walking field trips to make sure everyone is safe and comfortable. So if you're in the DC area or coming to DC, check out our Egypt on the Potomac field trips. All right, so for tonight, we are very uh, honored to present to, with you, present to you all tonight, Mr. Donald Godfrey, who will be speaking on leaving freedom to find peace, my life's journey. Mr. Godfrey states that racism and enslavement is the foundation of the Americas and the, and the threat of racism continues in the United States to this day. Racism is crumbling this country. What should you do? Leaving the United States and fighting, loving the United States and fighting in its wars for our freedom has been unfulfilling. What solutions can we embrace to address this problem? In this two-part presentation, Donald Godfrey will conduct a book talk on his memoir, Leaving Freedom to Find Peace, My Life's Journey. This book chronicles Godfrey's life growing up in a racist United States to finding peace in Ghana, West Africa. He will conclude with a discussion on possible solutions for Blacks in America to address the myriad of problems faced in the United States. Mr. Godfrey has served 21 years in the US military, four years and the United States Navy Submariner Radio Man Communicator, and 17 years for the U.S. Coast Guard radio, as a U.S. Coast Guard Radio Man. He retired in Washington, D.C. as a Chief Communications Warrant Officer. He then worked as an Information Systems Security Consultant for Management Technologies, Alpha Tech, and Corbett Technologies, British Systems Associates prior to joining the Foreign Service. Born in Jacksonville, Florida, he was the first to integrate public schools in Duval County. He received his BA degree from Regents College University of New York in 1996 and obtained his MS degree in 2004 from the University of Maryland University College. He has been a certified information system security professional 
since September 2000. Donald Godfrey is married, has eight children, four of whom are adopted, and he is accompanied by his wife, Winifred, and three children currently. Donald enjoys studying ancient African history and gives African history presentations to local colleges and on local forums. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Donald Godfrey. So Don, we're gonna ask you to come on in. All right, can you hear me? We can hear you and we can hear you. Yes. All right, I'm gonna start it up now. All right. All right, are we good? I'm gonna to need to share your screen. Oh, share, 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 share. All right, how about now? Not yet. Um, I, didn't, I didn't share it? No, not yet. It's... Oh, there it is. There it is. Yes? No. Oh. Are, you, are you on a Zoom? Go to the main Zoom room and then click on share screen. You know, we've practiced this uh, several times. And, uh, okay. There we go. All right. We're cooking right. now. You're looking good. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Ajo. How are you? Good evening, and we are in the building. All right. All right. Yes. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. I, I didn't know I was going to be talking to such a wide audience. But uh, anyway, um, my name is Donald Godfrey. I, uh, I wrote a book called Re uh, Leaving Freedom to Find Peace. Um, my story starts with my house being bombed by the Klan. Um, but, you know, um, in the South, we were terrorized. We were terrorized almost daily uh, by one way or another. Um, I'm going to talk about some current history right, right now. Just recently, just recently, um, the White House passed the, uh, not the White House, but the Congress passed the uh, lynching bill. And, um, but the lynching bill had been before Congress since, the, since 1900, 1900. So it took them 122 years to pass the bill. The thing that's so ironic about that to me is, um, it took them a hundred something years to say it was illegal to kill black people, you know. Um, H. Rap Brown said, violence in America is, is, is um, American as humble pie, or is American as pie. Uh, but anyway, when my house was bombed, I was told by one of my friends, we, we were playing, and uh, this was before the house was bombed. And he said, we were talking about what we wanted to be when we uh, grew up. I told him I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be like John Glenn. And he told me, he said, um, you can't be an astronaut. I'm like, why not? He says, because you're a Negro. And they, they don't have Negroes as astronauts. So that was not like my first inkling of what racism was. Because to me, if I could... If he could do it, I could do it, you know. But um, so my mom enrolled me in uh, in an all white school. But before that, the bombing in Birmingham that took place in uh, six, uh, the sixth of September, nineteen sixty-three. Um, I'm sure everyone heard of the four little girls, and they were killed. But uh, there was one survivor. And this happened, you know, in, in Birmingham. Um, there was one survivor, her name is um, Sarah Collins Rudolph, and she is the 
only other survivor of a clan bombing that I know of other than my mom and, and myself currently today. Um, Martin Luther King thought this would shock white folk into, um, you know, into realization that this violence was just unbelievable to blow up a church on a Sunday after Sunday school. But that didn't, that didn't work. But my mom enrolled me um, September 1963 also in uh, an all-white school called Lackawanna in Jacksonville, Florida, Duval County. And these are two pictures of me, and that's me in the back, in the back of the class um, with Miss Brandon. Um, I was moved back there for the picture. I, we were sitting in alphabetical order, and I was sitting like in the second row, and then when they took the picture, I had to move in the back. But um, on the 15th of February, 1963, the Klan blew up our house uh, around 2.30 in the morning. Before they blew up the house, they called the house, and they were um, my grandmother and, you know, the adults in the house would pick up the phone and you know they would hang it up and they would never talk so i got curious and um, when the phone rang one one evening i picked it up and they said you better take the nigger out of the school uh, out of school or something bad's going to happen so i was asked um, you know they said who was that on the phone and i i said i don't know they, they hung up about i don't know a week or so two weeks later they burned a cross in a field, an empty lot across from our, our home. And so on the 15th of February, 1964, our house was bombed around 2.30 in the morning. There were no police. There were no fire department that came to the rescue. There was no rescue. There were no ambulance. There was no one on the scene. Only. The only people that showed up was um, the, the neighbors, and um, there was no media coverage. You know, today media is everywhere, but there was no local media coverage of this. The only media that picked it up some kind of way was uh, the New York Times. But um, so that kind of shattered not only the house, but it, it, it shattered the family. And... Um, That it broke us up, and we were homeless for a little bit. The um, there were three sisters. Well, I'm, I'll go through the family. I'll, I'll go through the family here. But anyway, we had to move out of the house. We were living with um, uh, church members, and um, we were shattered. This is my father. Now, my fo my mother and father were never married, so he didn't live with us. He he lived uh, with his parents. And uh, he died when I was four. He was a, a soda jerk, you know, the guy that worked behind the um, soda and did ice creams and, and uh, Coca-Cola. But um, he worked in a, in a um, drugstore called Lily's Drugstore. He also went to college. He finished high school. He went to college. They said he was very smart, uh, but I have no memory of him at all. He died when I was four. He was 25. This is my, this is his mother, um, Rhoda Mae Ricks. Uh, she was an entrepreneur. She cooked, she cooked everything. Um, but she would sell pies, cakes, honey drippers, um, fried chicken boxes. We would have fridge, um, uh, fish fries. And my grandfather would go fishing and come back with a lot of fish, so we would have fish fries. And that's what she did. She also worked for the school board as a cook. But um, I think she didn't have much Social Security because of her, you know, she, she made money, cash money. So she worked until, until she literally died. Um, she used to uh, go to the dog track. She, she was good with the dogs, and she would bring in extra money like that. She told me um, that... Uh, she knew the dogs because she traveled with them. Anyway, 
she would be driving home like one and two o'clock in the morning. You know, I, I was afraid for her, but she she just had to work. And I asked her how come she didn't quit. She said she had she just had to work. This is my grandfather. My grandfather. This is James E. Ricks. He was a um, half Cherokee. Uh, they called him Red. Now this is this is the everything man. I mean, he was a carpenter, a fisherman, a hunter, a mechanic, a mason, a farmer. He was a veteran in World War II, um, and like I said, he was native um, Cherokee. Uh, he died on the 23rd of uh, September, 1967, about 18 days before my 10th birthday. That was a that was traumatic for me. Um, trauma. I can I can barely talk about my grandfather without um, crying, but uh, yeah, he was he was everything. This is our, my mother, Alana King. My mother started out as a um, as a babysitter, and then um, she worked as a domestic help or a maid um, with a banker. And there was a, a large bank back in the time called Barnett Bank, and Mr. Barnett was the owner of the bank. It was a family bank, family-owned bank. And she worked for the family, her and my grandmother. Um, and she used to take care of the children. So one Christmas, um, Mr. Barnett gave her a $50 check. And she said that she went straight to the college with that and enrolled in college with that money. So she is the first in our family to finish college. My grandmother's uh, Grandma Rhodey and uh, Grandma Godfrey, they finished fifth grade at the most. I think one of them even said they, they finished third grade. So, you know, um, Grandma was a uh, domestic help, and um, she worked until she couldn't work anymore either. So, you know, we, um, we're working people. This is my dog, Tiger. I don't know if uh, anyone is old enough to remember Lassie. <laughs> well, Tiger did everything. Tiger went everywhere with me, whether I wanted him to go or not. I couldn't. I couldn't make him stay home. He would climb the fence. He would dig out from under the fence. We would put it in the. Uh, back in them days, we had a porch, and the porch had a screen. He would jump through the screen and get out. So uh, he followed me everywhere I went. This is my guardian. This is my guardian angel because anybody that bothered me, the tiger would jump. You know, he I, I don't want to make it sound like that, but he was known for biting kids in the neighborhood that, that used to mess with me, that used to beat me up. I used to get my butt kicked a lot. But, you know, tiger kept him away. Anyway, after they um, blew up the house, there were um, there was one person, his name was William Sterling Rosecrans, he pled guilty, and there were four other Klansmen that were acquitted. This upset my grandfather. I mean, it upset him badly. And uh, he, well, let me go back. I'm going to go back. Um, in the book, it talks about how he and his, uh, his army buddy, Mr. Brown, uh, plotted and um, burnt one of the uh, Klan members' house down. They, they burned it to the ground. And I was there for that meeting, although, you know, I I didn't know what I was listening to at the time until I started doing some research um, at the uh, National Archives, and I read where um, this person's house was burned down. And I remembered the conversation between Mr. Brown and my grandfather about getting revenge. Uh, anyway, I was the first to integrate um, the school system in Jacksonville, Florida, Duval County. And uh, from the, I went to Forest Park and all the way up to the fifth grade. And then after that, I went to back to Lackawanna. And from Lackawanna, I went on to high school at DuPont Junior High in Wilson. But after my grandfather died, I, I really uh, took a tailspin. I was a AD student most of the time, most of the time. But um, 
by the time I finished high school, I was failing every class, um, every class. And I think, if I remember correctly, one of my teachers gave me an extra a credit or two just so I could uh, join the military. Yeah, I, I didn't have the grades to uh, go to college. I was also one of the first patrol boys in Duval County, first black, I should say, patrol boys in Duval County. So I'm, I'm like the first of a lot of things. Uh, so I joined the Navy for a couple of reasons. Number one, my girlfriend, my, my first wife, her name is Belinda, she, uh, she was pregnant before, before I graduated. So I'm 17 years old, got a baby coming. I um, joined the Navy, and um, they told me I qualified for two things. That was uh, cook and radio, and I had already learned how to cook from my grandmother. So, you know, at least I thought I knew how to cook. I could cook fried chicken and stuff. So, anyway, so I, I took radio, and uh, from that, radio men, they do long-haul communications, do um, so we we did we did all facets of communication. Now communications is mostly satellite and uh, ground waves and stuff like that. I joined the submarine fleet because Belinda, my wife, my first wife was pregnant, and um, I had to take care of the, the child, and they were paying one hundred and fifty dollars extra a month for um, sub duty. So that hundred and uh, that was good money back in those days. So on a seaman's pay, as a matter of fact, an E2 seaman apprentice plus one hundred and fifty dollars a month, I could send you know money home for uh, diapers and Similac and stuff. But um, I joined the military. I mean, I joined the submarine force. And this is me in the radio shack. Um, back. 20 years ago, this might have been a classified um, picture, but it's no longer classified. Um, you can see all the equipment that's inside the room, and that is about the size of the room itself. It was very small. It was a very small room. If we got four people in there, they all had to like um, pass by each other and pull in their guts. This here is uh, Quartermaster Chief Anthony Mathis. Anthony Mathis is a hero. While we were on subs, and this is in the book, while I was on the Will Rogers, and we were doing angles and dangles. Angles and dangles is when, this, when they just take the sub on a dive, or they, they take it up. They make it do all kinds of things, almost like an airplane underwater. But um, we decided, or the captain decided, to uh, take a 45-degree angle dive uh, towards the bottom. And we almost hit bottom if it weren't for Chief Mathis, and because the captain froze. Uh, you, you know, we can, you can learn more about it in the book. But the captain froze. Chief Mathis took control, blew the ballast tanks, and we didn't hit bottom. We were like, he says, because, you know, he was at the control control center. Uh, he said we were about 25 feet away from the bottom, from hitting bottom. So um, I don't know that story. But the story is also in the book. He was, he's a hero. And never be recognized because it was, it was never reported. The reason why it was never reported is because the captain would have, would have lost his command. This is me on board the sub, Will Rogers, with my buddy, RM1 Tobias. Yeah. So, uh, um, being on subs is arduous duty, and it, it took a toll on me and Belinda and, and uh, Christopher, the first child. So um, I got out and joined the Coast Guard because um, the Coast Guard, I was told, didn't get underway as much, and that was playing havoc, being underway for three months at a time, 108 days. Yeah, 108 days. So they sent me to New Orleans, and I was still a radio man, and I worked in the Hale Box building. I saw. Four Mardi Gras. I was there for four Mardi Gras, and Chief Mathis came to visit, visit, visit us one year. Um, from there, I went to the Coast Guard Cutter Butte down in uh, Key West, Florida. And uh, this is the Kushnet, our sister ship. I couldn't find a nice picture of the Ute. 
so I don't to use this one. Anyway, uh, we, we were down in Key West. Uh, let's see here. We were down in Key West, and for the most part, um, we did drug interdiction, um, rescue Cubans, Haitians, and the policy for Cuban and Haitians are the exact opposite, but I think we, we all know that story. Um, here's another Cuban rescue. This is not our boat, but you know, this just gives you an idea of how many Cubans that uh, we would rescue at a time. And this this went on for at least two years, if not longer. I, I made chief warrant officer while I was in Key West, and this is my mom. She came down to uh, congratulate me. Um, so now um, I'm an officer that didn't go to college. I had some college. While I was down in Key West, I had I got my uh, yeah I, I, I had got my associate's degree, and I was going to college, and I met this young lady here. This is Winifred Maureen Marsh. This is my second wife. Although I did, I didn't tell you about the divorce, the divorce, the divorce. This is my second wife. This is a very, very. Um, dynamic woman. She knew finance. She knew, um, I want to say fine wines. She, she, was, she was very sophisticated. But one of the things that most attracted me to her was uh, her knowledge about uh, finance and uh, the stock market and investing. And I would go through and I would ask people, you know, what's the stock market? What What, what is it all about? And I would get Little or no answer. Some of the answer was like, well, it's like gambling. And, you know, I, I don't know what that means. So she was able to explain it to me and um, and introduce me to Raymond James. So um, I didn't know Raymond James was not a person. <laughs> yeah. um, I went to Washington, D.C. After, after I made Chief Warrant Officer Communications, I um, was transferred to uh, Washington, D.C., and while I was in Washington, D.C., I attended the Million Man March. Um, over the years, I had been doing, uh, well, since I was in the Coast Guard, I had been giving African American history, uh, you know, Black History Month lectures, uh, Eyes on the Prize, and uh, some other um, kind of things like that, um, history on how black people contributed to. Uh, America, as far as the uh, traffic light, the gas mass, and um, blood transfusion, and stuff like that. Um, but the Million Man March actually uh, transformed me. The first book that I read that was African centered was um, uh, The Miseducation of the Black Man, uh, of the Negro, The Miseducation of the Negro. And I then began, uh, it opened my eyes about a lot of things. Um, there was a study group that Glenn K., um, Glenn Kirkland, had, had, he was attending, and him and I were to attend. And as I began to gather more information, man, I, the more I became interested in, you know, African culture. I had always been inter interested in African culture back in the 60s with James Brown, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, um, you know, um, Black and I'm Proud, the, the, the um, Black Power Movement back in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, Funkadelic, um, War, um, people like that. Um, Marvin Gaye, what's going on? So I was, I was really, really, um, I don't want to call myself an activist, but I was black conscious. And when I went to the Million Man March, I took an oath that I would... Uh, participate in the black community and, and do my best to, to help. So that's what I've been trying to do. After I retired, I um, went to these jobs and uh, I also uh, was a uh, CISSP, a Certified Information Systems uh, Security Professional. And I worked for a lot of what they call them Beverly Bandits. I didn't get my certification until I came back from Bangkok. I went to Bangkok 
Mantex printed the Bangkok as a information system security officer. I had not been certified yet, but uh, I did such an outstanding job there. Uh, when I came back, they I took the test and I, I passed it on the first time. That, Turn the volume on. Okay. I was told to turn the volume up. I'm not sure if that's any better or not. But um, anyway, I was I was told that um, they they look when I came back from Thailand. I took the test and um, I passed the CISS, CISSP. I was told that people don't pass it on the first try. I did. After that, I was I was um, getting a lot of jobs. I was getting plenty, plenty of jobs uh, with uh, corporate technology, BAE, and um, as I would, I was searching to try to get behind a Unix platform, and there was it was just a lot of um, jobs available for um, information system security because it was it was a fledgling um, technology at the time. I got my contract got cut by man uh, by one of the Navy con contracts, and we were cut off. And at that time, I had submitted to go into the Foreign Service. And um, so, as I left one job, I moved into the Foreign Service. Um, at that time, Colin Powell had started a um, diplomatic readiness initiative, DRI. And what DRI was, it was um, to fill in gaps. There was people that were retiring. And there were very junior people and they, had, they didn't have any middle, middle magic management. So what I provided at the time was, uh, being a radio man, I knew how to send cables or messages. They call them cables in the Foreign Service. Number two, I was a um, information system security officer, so I knew uh, IT security, and um, I had been a manager, so you know I, I kind of fit that mold what they were looking for, and I joined the foreign service. But while I was in um, Thailand, I, I kind of skipped over Thailand. Let me go back to Thailand. While I was in Thailand, a, a brother told me that um, you know I was very African conscious and everything. He said, well. You know, kind of tongue in cheek. Since you love Africa so much, why don't you uh, join the Foreign Service? And I asked him how much was the Foreign Service paying. And he said, "Well, they'll start you off between 38 and, and, and 42." Well, at the time, I was making over 100 as a contractor. So I'm like, "Nah, I don't want to take that pay cut." And um, also during that time, I uh, I was giving Black History uh, lectures. And uh, I had invited uh, Renoko Rashidi over, and he came. He came and he did his research on um, um, Africans in the Far East. I think that's the name of it. But um, because it was Thailand, it was hot. Um, it, was, it was miserable hot over there, man. You're talking about humidity. And uh, he didn't really like the nightlife. I, tr I tried to introduce him to the nightlife to take him around a little bit. He didn't like it. And it, Thailand is, as you see it on t t television, is probably not as uh, violent, but you know it, it has the potential to be that way. And it's um, the lights are bright. Um, so I, when when I joined the Foreign Service, they sent me to these uh, places. These are all the places that I, I went in the Foreign Service, and uh, the first place they sent me was Norway. Now, keep in mind, I joined the Foreign Service to go to Africa. And the first place they sent me was Norway, and I was closer to the North Pole than I was to um, to Africa. And I did uh, two years in Norway, two winters, and the winters are brutal there. But the people are so nice there. This is the first time I've ever been around white folk that didn't seem to have much discrimination at all. No discrimination because you're black. Now, they were discriminate because you're not Norwegian or, you know, um, and they did that in Thailand also. If you're not Thai, you didn't get the Thai price. You got the foreign price or the foreign price. If you're not Norwegian, 
you weren't served first, they were served in Norwegians first. So it had nothing to do with the color of your skin. Um, they had the same thing going on in Ukraine. They wouldn't let black folk on the train. And I said, well, you've got to understand the culture. They're going to let their people get out first. If they're going to let anybody out, they're going to let their people get out first. So it, it, I can't say it didn't have anything to do with race, but that's what I know from Norway. Um, I went to Accra, and when I was in Accra, um, I was in Accra for five years. My wife loved it. My wife felt at home because she's from Jamaica. And um, she... Um, she's spiritual. She didn't know. She didn't know she was spiritual in that way until she got there. When she got there, she she said, "Don, I, I felt like something just grabbed me, and I I fell to my knees and kissed the ground." Yeah, I saw her kiss the ground, but I, I didn't know what she was doing. Um, while I was there, President Obama visited Accra, Ghana. I don't know if any of you remember that, but. Um, him going to Cape Coast was impromptu. Uh, we weren't prepared. We prepared for everything but that. And I got an assignment to go out to Cape Coast and set up a communication center. And uh, at the time, internet was not a big thing in uh, Ghana or in Africa at all. Um, you might get it in Accra, and it was uh, spotty at the time. So. They had to pull cable, I want to say from Accra, out to the out to Cape Coast to uh, Coconut Grove Hotel where we were. And we had a terrible time setting up shop, trying to get um, communications up and running. But on the very last day or two days before, we got everything up, everything was running. They were, they were able to get in communications with everyone. But it wasn't easy. And I think we, we worked for a week straight, long hours, um, because uh, President Obama and his family wanted to go to Cape Coast and visit, visit the castle. So that's my story about that. And this is my home that my wife built. The, the dynamic woman I was telling you about, yes. She built both structures. She was there with contractors, and she told them, what, they, what she wanted from them. Um, people say, you know, um, well, what are some of your experiences in Africa? Well, it, it's different. It's very different. And it's very, um, it's not strict. It's formal. There are do's and don'ts. You just don't do what you want to do. You know, um, there are things that are frowned upon and those things that are frowned upon frowns upon your family, so you don't ever want to bring shame to your family. Um, what? Everyone says, good morning, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good morning, ma'am. Good afternoon, ma'am. If, you, if you're at a function and there are no chairs, me being an elder, you know, they, they give up the, they give up the chair. That, that's, that's just anywhere. That is anywhere. If an elder is standing, uh, the young person has to get up. Um, it's a cultural thing. Um, you have to, you don't have to. You should at least learn how to say uh, good morning, good afternoon, thank you, no thank you, where's the bathroom, I, you know, I, I would like something to eat in the local language. You know, um, we take things uh, we, we take our culture with us. We travel with our culture. That's how some of the African religions got here. They traveled with their culture. So when we go to these other countries, and I'll go back to Thailand again, we tend to want that country to conform to our American ways. And that's not just with black people. That's um, Americans in general. And, um, you know, they, they call the people stupid, and they are. Uh, Oh, they say they don't know what they're doing, and we tend to join in in that type of conversation, and it's embarrassing to me because I look at them and I say, well, where's your country? Where's your black country that you're running? You're not running anything. I mean, you, you, you're falling behind these people, 
So, you know, at least the Thais or the, the Africans, whatever African nation you're in, they're running their own country. They're doing their own thing. And, you know, you either have to conform or, you know, or be miserable. I shouldn't say it like that. I shouldn't say it like that. But um, freedom, you know, what is freedom? What is freedom to, to us? What is freedom to me might not be the same as what is freedom to you. And what is it that we need to do to obtain freedom? Um, so I'm, I'm going to go through this here. Um, this, this has nothing to do with the book. This is not in the book. When I showed you the house in the temple, that was, um, that's the end. We, we, we migrated. All right. Um, you know, how does the uh, black community define freedom? If we had freedom, what would it look like? You know, um, my view of freedom is free from being violently killed. You know, the violence in, in the U.S. is just unbelievable. You know, I, everywhere I go, I'm looking over my shoulder. You know, I go into this um, international store. It's got a lot of Cubans, got a lot of, not Cubans, excuse me, got a lot of Hispanics. Um, a lot of uh, Asians, a lot of black people, whether they are Jamaican or from the islands or from Africa, you know, an international store. And every time I go in there, man, I, I'm like, I'm looking around waiting for uh, Billy Bob to come up with his, um, his bulletproof vest and helmet. Um like I was saying earlier in, in the introduction, um, America, the Americas, was built on uh, racism, and uh, black slaves built the foundation, but it was built on um, racism or, or slavery. So that foundation itself, they never in their minds ever thought that we, black Americans, would be free. You know, um, a lot of the other islands and stuff, they fought for their freedom. We fought for ours, but we were basically liberated. So the foundation of slavery was never, was always, you know, what they built capitalism on. And the problem now is the foundation is crumbling because they can't maintain their racism. They can't maintain the foundation of keeping us on the bottom and, uh, you know, uh, benefiting, cap capitalizing on our uh, wages. So that's where the problem begins to come in. Uh, they know that their birth rate, when you hear it, they say, John, you won't, you won't replace us. Well, they know that their birth rate is in the negative for several reasons. So they see it. They know it. It's instinctual. Um, Dr. Welsing said it. It's, it's um, human instinct. So what do we do? If we know the foundation, if you take my uh, concept of the foundation is crumbling, and I think everybody will agree that the, the foundation of racism is crumbling in the United States. What do we do about it? Now, if you had a house that was on a foundation that was crumbling, you could do two things. You could either repair it or you could move. Now, I think I'm not a carpenter or a mason or anything like that, but I think I've heard that when the foundation of your house is cracked or crumbling, you have to move. Um, so if you stay, say you're going to, you're going to stay and try to fix this racism problem and you, you're, we as a community will get involved in up and bringing up the black community. We have to bring up the black community to save ourselves. Nobody's going to save us but us. Nobody, no thing. You know, we, we've been praying for 500 years praying, and these people have not changed. I already gave an example of 100 years of a bill before it passed, before it passed that it was illegal to 
kill black folk because they're black. You know, that's just, that's just ironic. So we have to come together as, as a uh, community, as an ethnic group, an ethnic group, black Americans. The Chinese are ethnic group. The Koreans are ethnic group. The Jews are ethnic group. The Muslims are ethnic group. So we black Americans have to come together as an ethnic group and work as one. Yes, I hear you all talking now saying, yeah, working as one is a difficult thing. That's right. But well, we're going to get to that. Um, got to work within the system, right? Because they say, you work in the system, you get into politics, um, change the laws, do all of that. You know, get in there and work. And see if you can make a difference. Or you can buy a large portion of land, build a black community, pool your money together, invest in the property, build it. Get builders, get contractors, get people, hire your own people, and build your own town. That's another solution, right? Because you don't want to leave, you want to stay. If you can't work in the system, you have to have your own system that you can work in. Um, so that requires working together. And that requires, um, I want to call it city coordinators or something like that, people who, who, are, who know how to build cities. Um, you can also fight for your freedom Take up arms and go against the government. I don't think that's a good idea, but you know, it's it's out there. You know, I don't see any any. Uh, matter of fact, I, I've never told anyone to pick up arms against anyone, so I don't agree with picking up arms. That's why I decided that you know going somewhere else was better for me, because I don't have much faith in the other four uh, ideas, and I can go somewhere, at least I can, I, I was able to uh, leave, and you don't have to go to Africa, in my opinion, you don't, you just have to go somewhere where it's majority black, where people look like you and somewhat act like you, you know, they have this same um, spirituality or soul. All right, so um, you've heard these things before. Uh, to make a, a system change, we need to vote, although they are doing their level best to keep us from voting. And one of the questions is, why do we have to keep signing this voting bill every seven to ten years? You know, um, I read up on that, and everybody should, because it's part of history. We have to vote in a black block. That came from Malcolm X. Um, voting in a black block, meaning that we're going to consolidate all of our votes, and whoever gives us the best uh, deal is who we put our money behind. We, we're talking about money. We're not talking about votes. Politicians don't work for votes. That, well, they do work for votes, but once they get in office, your vote don't mean anything. It's money. It's how you're going to help them get to, you know, passing a bill or something. So you have to put money in their pocket. Matter of fact, um, um, Claude. Claude Anderson. Claude Anderson. Read some of his books about uh, politics and uh, black wealth. Um, control your school boards. Get into local campaigns. Get into the fabrics. Because this is what they're doing. They're doing it at the local level now. If you're not paying attention, all the local level people from the uh, from the school boards all the way up into the state, into the other um, state elections, state senators, state representatives, they are infiltrating. If you're not there, they're going to be passing laws that you don't like. And so we have to get busy. Um, you have to control your community. If you're going to build your own community, you have to hire black policemen, 
black warriors, people who are going to represent us in that community. All right, I, th I think I've already gone through this. Yes, yes, yes. This is um, for the local governments. I'll give you um, some time to look, look through it. Um, like I said, pull black wealth, um, purchase a large swath of land, you know, get into municipal incorporation, uh, townships, uh, building your own schools and communities and teachers. Teachers are important. Having a black police force and law enforcement. And yes, you should discriminate. Yes, you should discriminate. You should do what your nemesis does. Your nemesis discriminates, so you should too. And you know, you don't want bad actors in there either. You want to keep out um, certain people that's going to bring problems. Or you can migrate to a black country, or majority black. There's Jamaica, Trinidad, Tobago, um, uh, Trinidad, Barbados, I'm sorry, Trinidad, Barbados, Belize, a lot of the um, Caribbean islands down there, Bahamas. Um, so, or you can go to Africa. Ghana is nice. I like Ghana a lot. Um, before you go, you might want to do some study on the economics, the lifestyle, the culture, the religion, the law, education, medic, medical care, the infrastructure, infrastructure. In most uh, countries, uh, I want to say outside the United States or outside of Europe, the infrastructure is not uh, developed well. So you, you're going to have to deal with not having power and water sometimes. If you want to know about any country in the world, you can go to uh, the CIA World Facebook, uh, Factbook. It's Factbook. That's a typo. It's not Facebook. It's Factbook. And um, they will tell you everything about the country. Just got to understand that there is some bias in there. Okay? Um, you can also Google about the country that you want to go to and learn everything. Just Google it. Um, if you're going to leave, if you decide to leave, you need to sell everything because you're starting over. This is a, I want to say this is a psychological thing. Sell everything because the, especially your appliances. Most places in the world, is, is 240 votes. Most places. I think Jamaica maybe 110. But in your television, washing machine, dryer, all that stuff, it's not going to work. So um, you have to sell everything. If you bring it, you're going to need a, a step-down transform. And that's, I don't want to call it a problem, but it doesn't work as, as well as uh, just having a 240 uh, refrigerator or 240 appliance. Wherever you go, there will be no utopia. Every country has its problems. And if you're going to a predominantly black country, it's probably not uh, going to be up to the U.S. standards. So you're going to have to deal with not having lights sometimes, war, internet. You're going to have bugs, and if, depending on how far you live from the city, you're going to have a snake. Um, you're, just, you're going to be living with nature because that's what these countries are. They're there. People live off the land. Um, you may have difficulties getting quality maintenance. Uh, you just have to keep doing it and keep doing it until they get it right. Healthcare. Uh, healthcare is very important for a lot of people my age and older. So you want to go somewhere where the healthcare is good. Healthcare is very good and gone. Very good. Um, and it's not expensive. But your insurance, I don't think your insurance will cover you if you're an African. But you, I'm, I'm telling you, I think most Americans can pay out of pocket unless it's some serious stuff. And if it's that serious, maybe you should go come back to the States 
I'll go to India. India is very good with their uh, medical. Um, and it will be good to speak a few words of the local language. These are the things that um, I find we don't want to do or we, we find that it's not necessary because the country that we're in speaks English. Well, they only speak they mostly speak English in your presence. When you're not around, they speak the local language. So understanding and, and speaking some of the local language is less of an insult when you're in somebody else's country. You know, uh, people get all upset because the Mexicans come or the Hispanic come and, and they don't speak English. And, it's, and then we go somewhere else and we do the same thing. We don't bother to learn the local language. All right. For us to become an ethnic group as black Americans to work within the system, we, uh, we have some issues that we have to address. And, you know, we can't get along within our own families. We dislike or hate on each other. That's the word, hate on. We have no unity. We undermine each other's efforts. And we're jealous. And... You know, that might come from psychosis. And because we have been traumatized for since we've been here, even before we got on the ship, our ancestors went through a lot of trauma. All of that trauma has been internalized, and it gets into the DNA. There are study, studies about uh, post-traumatic uh, stress disorder getting into the DNA of people and it's passed on. And not only is that trauma passed on through the DNA, it's passed on through behavior. Um, anyone that has taken psychology knows that um, if a parent is traumatized by something, they don't want that child to go through the same thing, so they're fearful. And that child might not know why mom or dad is screaming at them, but something had happened. So that trauma is, is a behavior a reaction to something and you know being burnt alive blown up uh, raped uh, quartered that's another word quartered i mean that you know they, they spread your arms and legs out and pull you apart and our ancestors watched this they made us watch it i mean they made us watch all kinds of stuff and that trauma got into us and this is the reason in my opinion why we have so many problems now. There, there's just there's just an abundance of problems that we we've had for the 500 years that we've been here. Um, here's some of the things that come out of this trauma. You know, dysfunctional family, anger, uh, continued path to destruction. A continued path to destruction, meaning that you're not satisfied until you have done something just out of this world until it destroys you. Addiction. We're, we're, we're addicted people to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, soda, you know, you name it, we're addicted to it. Um, abusive and dangerous behaviors. I don't have to go through that one. Uh, incoherent thought process. Um, you, you can't talk to people because they seem not to understand what you're saying, or maybe it's me that can't process my thoughts properly to communicate. You know, so we're saying, man, you're crazy. You, you, why you say something like that? You know, everybody's crazy. Yes, everybody in Black America, in my opinion, is crazy. We, if they've gone through trauma through their family, if it two generations, three generations back, anywhere in there, um, you've probably been traumatized. So I can hardly read this because the camera is uh, facing it. But um, PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, is described as a um, diagnostic uh, stature. Man, I can't hardly see the word. But um, manual, it's been it's been identified in the medical medical field and and has a relative and comparative diagnosis. So they have defined what PTSD is, a post-traumatic stress disorder. And 
you only have to have it have have to have it happen to you once, and you can be classified as PTSD. Here are some of the things that um, would cause post-traumatic stress disorder, and I think many of us have experienced something like this in one form or another in our lifetime. Uh, if you haven't, then you are very lucky. And I would think our ancestors, all of them, experienced some some form of this in their lifetime over and over again. Not not more more than once. More than once. Now I'm going to get into what I think or what has been documented by um, some brothers that came out of the nation of the nation of Islam. The, the names are here. Like I said, I, can, I can't read it because of the screen is kind of in front of it. But this manuscript, if you see there, that manuscript is very good. If you are interested in understanding how to correct our problem, this is a must read. It's free. You can get it off the internet. I based a lot of my comments on what came out of the book and some of the uh, information that I've read. And it's not a book, excuse me, came out of the manuscript. Came out of the manuscript, but uh, it's very good. It tells you what post traumatic slave disorder is and um, how it has manifested in our uh, communities. Very good. Um, and I gave you some examples here. You got post-traumatic slave disorder, PTSD. You got post-traumatic slave syndrome, PTSS. And you got post-traumatic stress disorder. It is confusing to people, so I'm going to always refer to anything that you see with PTSD is going to be slave disorder. We're talking about us. Here are some good books um, that will kind of make you a little bit more aware of what's going on psychologically um, in our heads and how we got kind of turned around. Um, I want you to also know that these are just my opinions about us being turned around and some of the things I say, because they're just my opinions. I'm looking at life through through different glasses, and this is what I see. All right, here, here are more materials. These materials came out of the manuscript. I just kind of cut and paste them onto a slide. But these are some of the uh, recommended uh, materials to read. And as you can see, you can, there's Claude uh, Anderson. Um, Black Labor, White Wealth. That's a very good book on, you know, financing and and um, how we are not familiar with doing much in financing. You know, it's not taught in the schools, and we have to learn it from each other, basically, or have to go to college or school to learn, you know, how to finance a home, how to mortgage a home, how to buy a car. Um, you know, just the general stuff of having a budget. Um, now, I'll, I'll give you some time to read this. Um, I'm not able to read it. But this is uh, basically what we should be seeking in ourselves and uh, to improve our family and our community. As I was saying, um, post-traumatic slavery disorder, PTSD, um, has been 500 years of torment. Uh, it's a paralysis of um, the psyche, the body, and the spirit. It's miseducation. Miseducation. And um, we have taken on poor living and eating habits. That leads to countless medical problems and diseases. You know, this is part of that syndrome of self-destruction. We tend not to care. 
I, I don't care. I don't care. It tastes good, or I'm, I'm just uh, tomorrow is not promised to us. You know that kind of thing. So I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And we know that we have a lack of self-history, and we have self-hate, and that self-hate, and every stuff like that, it comes out of that um, psychosis. It comes out of the psychosis. We were taught to hate each other. We were, we were set to hate each other. I'm, not, I'm sure all of you remember um, Django, uh, Django on Chain, and uh, some of the things that uh, we did to each other in that movie made us, you know, they just turned us into animals, man. So, this is. These are some of the things that um, post-traumatic PTSD has um, has caused in our experience, our black experience in the U.S. This is a very hard, um, difficult slide to read, but if you if you look at it, it says uh, comparative disorders, post-traumatic stress, and you can look at some of the uh, modes and. Um, the, uh, what is that? Uh, I can I can hardly read it. It's a very bad slide. Ah man. Yes. I understand I should speak louder. Okay. I'm almost finished, so if um if you didn't hear me, um, maybe we I can answer some of your questions at the end. All right, like I was saying earlier, we, we carry our culture with us, also good and bad. We, we carry the good things and we carry some of the bad things with us. And, you know, not speaking one, not speaking one to speak the local language, in my opinion, is not good. Um, saying hello and thank you and stuff like that. Uh, we tend not to want to learn uh, or change or learn new things. Uh, we're good with being who we are, we don't look to, or I don't want to say as a whole, we should look more to learning and uh, understanding who we were before we came to the U.S. Um, when I was in high school, they told, they said that we had to take a foreign language, whether it was German, French, or Latin, I think, and I chose none of them, saying, you know, I when would I ever be uh, speaking French? And I wish I had taken it because when I went to Africa and I went to Conakry, they spoke French there and I had to learn how to speak French because the local language, I, I had to choose one or the other. And I chose French because there's a lot of French uh, former colonies in Africa and I would be able to communicate somewhat there. Um, even in the embassies, um, we black Americans really don't socialize with each other. We want to be amongst the Americans. And um, that was one of my problems. I don't want to call it a problem. I did not um, I did not socialize with Americans. I didn't go all the way to Africa to uh, to um, socialize with the people the same people that didn't like me when I was at home. So, uh, you know, I, I was in Africa and I was out with Africans. Um, so for us to repair ourselves or at least address the psychosis that we have, we have to first begin to understand who we were before we came over here. Um, and I, my mom did a DNA um, sample and it came so we my mother's mother's mother um, we came from Guinea Bissau in that area the uh, Castleman area so I kind of have an understanding of that area I, I did some research and I studied it and you know these things enlighten you it gives you an idea of who you were before you came over so we have to work on these three things and I'm going to say have to. We have to work on our mind 
uh, seeking knowledge, getting out of um, try to find a stress-free environment by meditating or doing something like that. You know, we have to take care of our bodies. We have to stop filling ourselves up with junk, and we know it's junk, but we don't care. That's the psychosis. We have to stop doing it, and we always, we always look to our higher power. But um, sometimes um, we don't have that higher power in tune with our body and our mind. So we have to do all of those things and try to work ourselves to working together. Because if we can do these things for ourselves, then we can start working together and making changes in America. But, you know, I'm not sure how well that's going to work. I wouldn't bet on it. So that's why I chose to leave. And um, my family has a choice. Some people don't have choices. They can come. They have a place to stay. Or they can stay here and try to make change. And uh, Ajima, oh, here's some side notes. Here's mm -hmm. some side notes. How much time do I have? Um, if you want to go ahead and finish, you know, this, this slide and we're, we're, we're on track for time. So you're good. All right. All right. Um, here's some side notes. All this stuff that um, is going on in politics. This right here is what uh, Biden and Harris ran on when they, uh, when they were running for office. They were talking about reallocating funds uh, and invest in the community. You know, I haven't seen that happen. Matter of fact, I hear no more about it. They were going to uh, reform law enforcement and uh, and tactics and mental health in the black community. I haven't heard any more about that. And um, reparation, they were talking about reparation. The only reparation I've heard about is California. It passed in California. I don't know what the uh, requirements are to receive reparation, but that's the only place I heard about it. It's not at the national level. And they were talking about addressing systematic racism. And, you know, I think everybody remembers this, this heartfelt speech that the young lady gave during the inauguration. You know, um, and everybody was all excited and, and clapping and stuff. I think this is my opinion. That's just a ploy. That, 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 that is something that they do to make us feel good and put us back to sleep, you know, because we're, we're angry and we want something done and we voted for you. And now here's a person that's going to make you all feel better. And we all feel better and we go back to sleep and none of these things that they promised us come to fruition because, you know, we, we, we pack to sleep again. Um, Here's another one. I didn't know that a convicted felon can still run for president. I'm thinking, all right, once they catch former President Trump, I have to give him his title, former President Trump, after they convict him of all of these things that he's done, he can still run for president. He can still run for president. There's nothing that says he can't. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> and here's a homework question. Why does the Voting Rights Act have to be renewed every seven, ten years? Why do they have to do that? And why, most of the time, they get a black person to sing the national anthem? These are just things that I wonder. Because I'm like, why do they always get, anytime they want to say, say a prayer, in public, they get a black person. Are we the only spiritual people in in, in the United States? Um, so, if you want to get in contact with me, or you want to see some of my work, here is um, my website. I, if you want to visit Africa, you can visit our place. Um, there's the website. There, it's called. Chambasi uh, Retreat, and 
my wife is, is very spiritual. She does readings. Um, you know, you can read about it in the book about how she, she does readings. Um, people call her from Jamaica, Canada, the U.S., um, the U.K., Ghana. Um, people call her from all over the place wanting, wanting readings. So she she's good. At, I, if, if I had to say, she's between 90 and 95 percent accurate. No. But there's my um, email address. The book can be found on Amazon, and I also have a uh, <clears throat> Facebook page that I post stuff from time to time. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I tend, my voice tends to go up and down, and I'm sorry that um, you didn't hear all of what I was saying, but hopefully I can go over it again and answer some of your questions. All right, Ajua. Thank you yes, very much. Yes, we are. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you um, for your presentation. And thank you for the work that you've been doing over the years. To our audience, if you have questions for Mr. Godfrey, please place them in the Q&A box and we will get to your questions. I will start us off um, just going back to your memoir. Um, someone mentioned in the chat, you know, how great it was hearing your family history. And, you know, I always say, hey, we all have a story to tell. And there's just such great history that we have in our own family lives. And I'm curious as to what inspired you to write this memoir. Can we start there briefly? Just tell us what made Try you. Try to do it briefly. Yeah. <clears throat> I worked for the FBI, um, well, as a contractor. I wasn't an FBI agent. But as a contractor with Corbett, we worked at the FBI headquarters. And I was just curious. I said, I wonder if I can get some information on the bombing since, you know, they were they were the ones that uh, cracked the case and arrested the people and everything. Um, so they gave me, I, I submitted for a Freedom of Information Act for you. And, um, what they gave me was about 30 pages and a lot of it was redacted. And I wasn't really satisfied with what I got. So um, I was living in College Park in the 90s, in the mid 90s, I was living in College Park here in uh, Maryland. And the archive was, was right down the street. So I went down to the archives and I went in there and I uh, started reading information and, and gathering information. And people would tell me from time to time, as I would tell them the story, you ought to write a book, you ought to write a book, you ought to write a book. So I had gotten all the information, and I sat down, and I started writing a book. And the book mainly was supposed to be just about the bombing, but it was it turned out to be a, uh, a long essay. You know, it was maybe 70 pages. And um, so I decided to talk about how it affected the family and how it affected me and, and so on and so forth. Um, um, my mother was in the NAACP and she had a certain attitude about black people had rights. And so that same attitude um, filtered down to me. And, um, you know, I, I was never taught to hate anyone. I don't hate anyone, but I have a preference of looking at people and saying I would prefer not to be around this this type of people are these people because they have a history of harming me or my people. They have a history of it, so why would I continue to try to be around them? Um, anyway, I can go on. I do it. So, no, that's great. That that leads to the next um, point. One of the things I found interesting in your presentation is when you talked about, um, of course, the bombing. And I do want you to talk a little bit more about that. But one of the things you shared that I think oftentimes get under, underrepresented in, in mainstream history books is the fact that Black people, um, Black men were protectors. So after the home got bombed, you spoke about um, members of the community, including your family, um, retaliating, or as I would see it, um, ensuring that you all were protected and that it that a message was sent that bombing 
home and that community will not be tolerated. That's the message I, I received when you explained how um, there were Black people who would retaliate against the Klan. Oftentimes, we don't hear that in mainstream um, or in, in oh, a lot yeah. of our books. But can you yeah. speak how... Well, go ahead, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank to you. add to that, can you speak to how that bombing impacted you and your notions and ideas around freedom. So if you want to speak to both points, um, that would be great. All right, yeah. Um, black people didn't, well, there are a few black people that didn't just capitulate. There was a riot in Jacksonville called the Axe Handle Saturday. Um, um, there were some protesters, they were, they were at Woolworths, the uh, black folk, the white folk got upset, came in with axe handles and started uh, beating heads in. And then there's a, a, a gang called the Boomerang Gang. They came in and, and squared things up. So um, that happened. Um, my grandfather, he took retaliation uh, because he was upset. And uh, um, there was another one. Uh, oh yeah, the Huffman boys. Uh, the Huffman boys lived in our neighborhood. We lived in two blocks of black. And that's why I went to white school. There were two blocks of black people. And the DeVoe family uh, were sharecroppers. So either Mr. DeVoe, the head of the family, was a sharecropper. And he sold a lot of plots to black people. And I'm going to assume he gave some plots or, you know, sold plots to his family. So there was two blocks of black people surrounded by white in Murray Hill, Jacksonville, Florida. It was called Murray Hill. And uh, the white school was close, and we walked to it. But anyway, um, the Huffman boys, they cleared out all the young clan um, so we could then start going up to Lackawanna called Madison Park and play basketball. So they cleared all of that out, and they would have gang fights. Every time they would go up there, they would have a gang fight. And uh, I wanted to go, but they said I was too young. I couldn't go. But, yeah, but we... We retaliated, and um, I am not a condoner of violence, but I do believe in self-defense. And if a person is trying to harm you, then you have the right to, to defend yourself. And I, I know how to use weapons, but I don't have any, and I don't want to shoot anyone. But you know, we, we might have to protect ourselves. That's the bottom line. Okay. Um, and how, speaking on the notion of freedom, how did the bombing as a, oh. as a child, how did that, we talk about trauma, and of course that was definitely a traumatizing event. Connecting it to your notions of freedom now as an adult, how did that bombing affect you then? And your well, the bombing, I, I didn't know, I didn't know it had a, I didn't know it had a negative effect on me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't know anything until I started looking into this PTSD thing, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but as I began to read more about PTSD and understanding um, what went on with us as far as the, uh, the torment and the, the, you know, the abuse and stuff, um, I began to realize that yes, you know, I had a problem, but uh, I, I don't think I'm answering your question properly. Um, what made me change? And like I said, it, the bombing didn't change me. It was just um, the times. Uh, growing up with Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad, uh, you know, hearing about them, um, the black power movement of fighting back, not laying down anymore. You know, H. Rap Brown, the Black Panthers, that was the era that I came up in. So it was no more of uh, laying down and, and getting your butt kicked. Um, it was more about fighting back, defending yourself. And um, then I, gained, I began to understand that that would only go so far. So, you know, you can't take up arms against them and trying to work with them. So I, I, just, I mean, this is just a process. And after a while, I just said, well, you know, I, I would like to go to Africa. And I met my second wife, 
Winifred, and she was from Jamaica. And I'm like, let's go to Jamaica. She's like, no, I'm not going to Jamaica. I got too much family. And see, I didn't know what that meant because I'm the only child, and we have a very uh, small family. So um, I didn't know what having too much family meant. Anyway, joined the Foreign Service, got a chance to leave. I was heavily influenced by Dr. Welsing and uh, and um, a public public enemy. Uh, yeah, public enemy. Well, let's take it from there, and um, I'm going to tie in a question from Louis Rosado, who asked, "How did you find freedom in Africa?" So, in your book, you speak of your journey of finding peace, finding freedom in Ghana. Can you speak to what sense of peace and freedom you were able to, to gain? Right. Well, it's just a normal thing. Uh, you walk into a store, you're not watched. Um, you stop by the police, you're not scared. You, I think the freedom that I, most, I can mostly identify with is I don't think about dying of a violent death. I go to the movies, I don't think about somebody coming in there with a gun and shooting up the place, blowing up the place. Um, when I'm stopped by the police, my heart don't start pounding. Um, the children and my grandchildren, they can run around and watch, play, chase ducks and uh, whatever animals in the yard. As a matter of fact, we had some cows come through the yard, the, the Fulani uh, herdsmen, they, they walk their cows through our, our, our yard as part of their path. That's a local thing, you know, because from what I understand, they walk from North Africa all the way to like uh, Ethiopia, walking. So uh, it's um, it's different. Uh, people treat you with respect. Um, yeah, it's it's just different. Um, like I was saying earlier, uh, being an elder, you can't stand nowhere. Nowhere can you stand on the bus, on the train, nowhere. In the supermarket, well, I can't say in the supermarket. If people think that Africa and Africans health problems, they have health problems. Well, they do have health problems, but they have herbs and stuff that cure a lot of their problems. If you look at some of the stuff about COVID in Africa, everybody thought Africa was gonna be just uh, ate up by COVID. As a matter of fact, they evacuated the embassy because they thought um, COVID was going to just decimate. And it didn't. That's because they had herbs. And I asked the people, I said, well, why do you think COVID is not affecting? They said, well, they don't know it no different than, than the flu or a cold. So they go and they get the herbal medicine and they take that. And I guess, you know, the antibodies, because their, their body is not their bodies are used to natural foods. It can ward off the disease and I, this is the science behind it. Once the antibodies is spread it around in the community because they all kind of eat out of the same bowl in, in a lot of cases. So that was the reason why they weren't decimated. And they, didn't, they still don't have the, the vaccine. You know, the vaccine is very limited. And um, <clears throat> help me out. Module, help oh, me no, out. You're doing, you're doing so I'm gonna, uh, we can go to the next question. So, um, and a lot of these questions are definitely um, looking for your expertise and your experience living abroad. Um, Cornelius would like to know, um, and I'm gonna combine Cornelius's and M. Penn's question. Um, he wanted to know what specific procedures um, are there to apply for citizenship in Ghana. And then M. Penn would like to know, can, um, can they rent in Ghana for several months? Um, are there any American communities there? So citizenship and repatriation, what um, has been your experience with um, All right. um, that? We, as Black Americans, really don't have a community, so to speak. We're spread out all over God. That's one thing. The second thing is, where can you find information? There, There is a, a website that I didn't put up, and I should have. 
that you can get in contact with a, um, a local organization of black Americans and they will walk you through the process. They are expecting you. If you want to come to Ghana, they will help you. Um, Ob Obadali. Obadali. I forgot Obadali. He's a professor at the University of Ghana. Uh, send me an email to my email address, and I will get you that uh, website. And um, I thought I might have his WhatsApp number. I don't have his WhatsApp number. But the website will give you all the information you need about getting a visa. If you have a, a passport that has not expired, you can go to the Ghana Embassy or, or find out on the, the Ghana website how to get a visa, and you can get your visa, come to Ghana, visit. I recommend you visit two or three times, get to know, you know where you might want to stay. Um, stand in Accra and Kamasi. I don't go to Kamasi much. But they are big cities, and they have big city issues, okay, traffic. So um, they're nice places. I always want to compare um, Accra. Accra is very busy. It has everything that you think you want. I don't want to say New York City, but it is uh, bustling. <clears throat> it is bustling. Um did I answer the question? Yes. Um, the next set of questions coming from AJ. Um, uh, he says, thank you for your story. If you were not living in Ghana, where would be your second choice of residence and why? Jamaica. Jamaica, okay. Jamaica's close. <clears throat> Jamaica has a different feel than Ghana because, you know, they're Jamaican. Um, but it's still that Africanness. You feel it. It's, it's there. Um, so yes, uh, the food is good. The food is excellent. The vibe is good. And that's another thing. You know, we, we, we don't, we don't understand freedom because you don't understand the vibe of freedom. And this is why, you know, um, I can't say why Jamaicans are, uh, kind of laid back, but there is a vibe that goes along with being at peace with yourself. Okay. Now, um, would you say that one of the things that you mentioned was that you observed that Black Americans struggle to unite even overseas? Are there countries where you feel that there was more unification of Black people? Black Americans? Yes. Other, were there other countries where you felt that there was more unity amongst Black people? Well, yeah, Ghana, because um, everywhere else I've been, I've been at the embassy. So Ghana is like home to me. So I'm in the community. And um, we're spread out, but there's a community called Pram Pram, where most Black Americans live. Pram Pram, Pram, Pram is off uh, the beach is on the beach, and uh, there's an ancestral wall that uh, Jerry Johnson ancestral wall. You can you can Google it or you can put it in YouTube, and you can see uh, what he's done is he put all the ancestors. I think he's got a hundred of them, and he gives a tour. But his wife has a restaurant, and Black Americans come there and, and congregate, listen to you know uh, '60s music and 60s and 70s, you know, OJs, Temptations, um, James Brown, we, you know, stuff like that. And um, it's a nice environment. I don't know how many of us live in Pram Pram. I don't really live in Pram Pram. I live another 20 minutes away by the roads are not good. But um, yeah, but I, I live, I live close. And I, I go go up there. I try to meet on Saturdays, and they're closed on Mondays. So we meet on Saturdays and uh, just kind of eat and drink and be merry. Okay. Other than that, um, I don't know of any other place where we gather, where there's a community. The Hebrew Israelites, they probably gather 
Mm-hmm. You know, there's a sect there, the Hebrew Israelites, and um, they are a clan on their own. You know, they, they, they kind of keep amongst themselves. Not that they're bad people or anything, but, you know, that's, I guess it's just like Judaism. All right. And along those lines, in terms of looking at different countries where Black people may want to uh, consider moving to if they wanted to uh, leave the United States, what are some other countries that are easiest for Black people to obtain permanent residency in? This is also coming from AJ. Yeah, I'm not going to step in that one. AJ is going to have to do his homework because um, you know, what's good for me might not be good for everyone else. Um, mm-hmm. I enjoy the bougie, but um, Nigeria, Abuja, Nigeria, but Nigeria is, is a uh, is a difficult place. Um, things can happen at a moment's notice. So, you know, I want to say you, whenever, anytime you go around, you, you have to be aware of your surroundings and you just can't go in and everywhere especially looking like an american this is i I don't go anywhere looking like an american i go looking like this and nobody bothers me but um he would have to do his homework because because people are poor in these countries they're poor in nigeria they're, they're poor in benin if you go to Benin, the Republic of Benin, you, you should speak French, at least. Um, go to Togo, you have to speak French. I don't want to say have to. You should learn to speak French or the local language. Awe is one of the local languages in uh, Togo. So you you have to want to be there, and you have to want to participate. Um, yes, we need to be a clan there also. We need to start our own businesses, start our own things, and, and they're doing that. I don't, in Ghana, they're doing that. Um, I don't know of any other place for black Americans to go and see other black Americans. I think Gambia might have some black Americans there. And I hear Gambia is very nice. Uh, okay. Um, Kwesi and Moa would like to know, what are your thoughts about black folks all moving to one state? Every black person in America moved to one state? Well, I don't know if it would be every black person, but this notion of uh, communities, I guess, or groups of large numbers of black people uh, pretty much taking over a state. You spoke a little bit about that earlier in your presentation, that's, taking over. That's an idea. I didn't think about that, but that's an idea. If you can get a large group of black folk to just say, okay, we're moving to this spot right here. And we're going to build it. We're going to pool our money together. <clears throat> yeah, I'm all for that. Yeah, because then you're, you're doing it on your own. But we've done that before, and they've, they've come after us. You know, they've come after us, and they've burned places down, and they've done it more than once. They, they haven't, you know, they've done it more than once. I think they've done it every time we've put up something. So you have to protect yourself because... I'm going to say prayer is not working. You know, we, we pray and pray and pray. Well, you pray and then you get up off your off your knees and, and you go take some action. Pray that you don't get hurt. Yes. Um, Kwe Samoa also mentions um, another organization, uh, Comb Kesi, uh, was having a presentation this week about trauma being passed down um, through generations from, fam- from the family. Um, and in their talk, they believe that one of the answers to addressing this trauma is to lean on our culture. What are your thoughts of, of African culture? What are your thoughts about, about that? Okay, well, I was going to, I was going to say lean on our culture means what? If you're talking about just black, black American culture, that's not going to get it. You got to understand how we got here and how we even got into the uh, Caribbean. I didn't know this until I read this book called uh, Prince Among Slaves. Um, There was this um, uh, Fulani, Fulani warrior captured. He was a prince. And um, 
he was put on a slave ship, and that slave ship, when it left Guinea, it stopped in several places before he even got to the United States. I didn't know this. I just thought when they left the Middle Passage, they sailed straight to their, their port. They did. They stopped at every port. They would trade, and they they would stop um, to the Bahamas. They would stop to Bermuda. They would stop to um, Haiti, Jamaica. They would stop all over and pick up people, let people off, buy and sell, and, and all the way up. So if you made it to the United States, through all that sailing, you got to be a strong person. Your ancestors were very strong. They were determined. And I think it would be a disservice to fall to, to fall short of that. That determination to succeed, to live. Um, I think I got off topic again, I don't So um talking about African culture, what roles would you think like traditional African culture uh, could play in addressing trauma? Knowing the history, knowing the history, knowing who, who you are, knowing, um, just knowing your history, culture. Um, our culture was stripped when we left our village. They stripped us of everything. So um, you don't have to be one of the local cultures of uh, Africa, but you are an American and you have an American culture. Now, we have to get rid of some of that garbage that comes with it so we can come together and do something. But until we face this psychosis and get rid of that minutia, uh, we're always going to be uh, taken advantage of. So that's all they're doing is taking advantage of us. Okay, and um, we're going to start winding down. And one of the things that I think a lot of people may want to know um, looking to live overseas, um, what are some methods and means of income and in using one's own um, expertise in another country? For example, Henry Mary asked, is the Ghanaian government or did the government make use of your expertise? Um, no. For one, let me answer that question before you go further. Mm -hmm. One thing, I'm still in the foreign service, so I still work for the government, and um, I can't participate in another government. I can't have a citizen. I shouldn't have a citizenship with another uh, country and working for the foreign service, especially I, I work in classified spaces. So, you know, I have to pledge allegiance to Ghana and still work for the United States and I don't think that that's going to work. Um, you, anyone that goes there must understand that the Ghanaians probably will not hire you because you don't speak the language and you're not of their ethnic group. That's how they work. So for us to do stuff, we have to come together and build our own. We have to take our technology. We, we built America. So we can go back to Africa and build our own place, you know? That's how I see it. But we have to come together as a group, as a clan. And, well, not even as a clan. A clan is too small. We have to come together as an ethnic group, and we have to get into politics. I mean, we have to get into politics here. Because politics is what makes the laws and makes things work in your favor. So, you know, there, there's a lot of work to do. And um, there's not too many young people there in Ghana at this time unless they were born there. Um, and they may be half Ghanaian, half uh, American, you know. But um, most of the people are retired. There's not that many young people. The only young people that are there that sh could provide some assistance in, in what they're doing and, and tell you all the other young people that are around. When I say young, I say uh, 40, 45, um, yeah, in that in that age is um, Brandon Rogers. Brandon Rogers has um, some property uh, way out from Accra. I mean, it's an hour and a half, I think, away from Accra, but he got some property out there and uh, he's selling plots 
and they will help you along. I mean, uh, they we're happy to help anybody that wants to get out of this situation that they're in because we know what the situation is. I mean, you, you have to be able to see it. If you're not seeing it, you, you're, you're, t you're turning a blind eye to it. Well, okay, so our last question for the evening then, speaking on um, purchasing land and going back to Ghana, you spoke about your home and um, the temple uh, structure that you have there. Can you speak a little bit more about if you would like um, your home and your um, the temple, what is that uh, for? And um, I, I don't know, we didn't talk about you discussing, but like I, I noticed your website, chambasi.com. Um, All right, so let me, let me tell you the story behind Ch Chambasi. Yeah. How much time do I have? Do I have another hour? No, not another hour. If you can make this maybe <laughs> a, a one minute, two minute uh, discussion. All right. Uh, Sir. <laughs> yes. Okay. So my wife is was is spiritual, and um, when she came to Ghana, she she really felt it. Um, we were introduced to uh, a king in Benin. There was a woman. Her name is Joyce Hope, and her um, brother Al Hope. They uh, had a seat. Had a seat at the uh, king of um, Porto Novo, Benin. She has a seat at his, uh, at his table. Anyway, we went, she was told things by a spirit called Mama Chamba, the mommies. Anybody that's African know mommy, mommy Wata. I mean, anybody that's been to uh, Haiti knows mommy Wata. But anyway, she was introduced to Mama Chamba, which is mommy Wata. She then began to understand all the things that had been bothering her that she was hearing in her head. It was almost like a calling. And in that calling, she was so moved that she wanted to build a uh, temple. She built the temple before she built the house. And I keep saying she. She built the temple. I'm like, we don't even have a place to stay yet, and you're building a temple? She says, yes, yes. The gods want me to build this temple, so I'm building it. So, yeah, the temple was built before the house. And uh, she's spiritual. Um, you can come and you can relax. She can do readings. Um, just be something other than geeked up in the United States. You know, just relax. And so also your the website, you, um, I'm not sure if this is current, but I believe that if people would like to visit Ghana, um, you all have like a um, bed and breakfast or like a rental property that someone can stay? Yes, 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 yes. We, we have, um, the house has 10 bedrooms and we can do a bed and breakfast. And there's also um, four chalets um, that you can do your own cooking and stuff. Um, we have refrigerators and, and uh, stoves. And, um, the chalets do not have air conditioning. So you, that's one of the inconveniences of being in Africa. You have to put up with some things, you know. But um, it's nice. It is very nice. It's very peaceful. And, and the website come. for that, is that the Chambasi.com website that, that we have on the slide here? That is it, Chambasi.com. Yeah. Um, I, I encourage everyone to take a look at that website, um, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful home, um, beautiful area. And if you're looking to visit Ghana, someone mentioned, you know, going for a visit, to see it, perhaps um, you can consider making Audrey, a well, what, One more thing, let me, let me yeah. put this in here. That, we built that place on the money that they gave me for just working in Africa for the past 13 years. That was the money that we, we put it in building the house. It, it was built. Um, it wasn't uh, It wasn't there. there. We had to clear that entire area. But go ahead. I just wanted to put that in. Okay, yes, I just wanted to give a shout out to your facility there in Ghana. Um, 
a beautiful facility. So just want to, you know, plug that. Um, final question, someone asked uh, twice. So I think they really want to know, since you're in uh, the foreign service and you traveled around, any thoughts about African-Americans moving to Somalia? Um, ask the question again. All I heard was Somalia. Um, what are your thoughts about African-Americans moving to Somalia? It was asked a couple of times, so I wanted to get that in for Cheryl. Somalia. Somalia is still having war issues, as far as I know. They haven't opened up a U.S. embassy there. They, they've been talking about opening one up, but they haven't. Um, Al-Shabaab is running around, as far as I know. Look on the CIA page and see. It, 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 would, it would have some information. Okay, well, Donna, we want to thank you uh, so much uh, for this great presentation. Thank you for sharing your family history, thank your you. story, um, being so open about your experiences, not only here in America, but also overseas. Um, a lot of people got a lot of great information. It has definitely been inspiring. Hopefully folks, we are inspired to tell our own stories. Hopefully we are inspired to travel abroad, um, learn a new language and be open to something other than just America, that there are other options for us in finding them and finding our freedom. There are options that we have and finding that freedom for us, for our families. So thank you so much, uh, Donald Godfrey. And um, next month on July 20th will be our next Wisdom Wednesday um, featuring Jackie Morgan. And she's going to be speaking on 12 steps to decolonizing the African mind. So coming, yeah. it, it's a great continuation from today's topic uh, from PTSD. So again, that'll be next month, July 20th. And we're here every third Wednesday of the month for our Wisdom Wednesday lecture series. Um, thank you again, everyone, for coming out. And this is going to close our program. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> any any final words, Donald? Uh, no, just come visit. And if you like it, stay. If you don't, you know, you can always come back home. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Hope to see you soon. Yes, 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 yes. So please, again, check out those sites. Take a screenshot of his contact information. And trust me, when you all go to chambasi.com, um, you will definitely, I was impressed with, with the home. And I actually go to Ghana quite often. I haven't been in a few years, but I do go to Ghana quite often. So um, now I feel like I have another place to, uh, to add on my list. You have <laughs> another place to add on your list. We're yeah. almost to a da. You know where a da? A da? Um, I I've heard of a dime. Well, we're closer to a dime than we are across. 